You know, one of the books that I really, really enjoyed reading, I picked it up a couple of years ago at somebody's recommendation, is a book by Chip Heath and Dan Heath called Made to Stick, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die. And uh, the authors of this book begin the book with um, a story about uh, actually a friend of a friend of theirs who was a frequent business traveler, happened to be in Atlantic City for a business meeting, and he needed to catch a flight home. He had a little bit of time to kill, so he went to a bar where a woman came up to him, a very attractive woman, and, and introduced herself and said, hey, can I buy you a drink? And he was really flattered, and so he agreed, um, and you know, he got to talking with her. The next thing he remembers was waking up in a bathtub in a hotel room, his body completely covered in ice. And he looked over and he sees a little table and there's a cell phone on the table and a note, big letters that says, don't move, call 911. The man dialed the number, described his situation to the operator, and the operator, who seemed to be kind of unfazed by this, surprisingly, said to him, I want you to reach carefully behind. She said, is there a tube sticking out of your lower back? There was. And he reported this to the operator. She said, don't panic, but I have reason to believe that one of your kidneys has been harvested by a ring of thieves who've been operating here. Paramedics are on the way. Please don't move. Now, that is one powerful story. And it's a complete lie. <laughs> it's a complete lie. That story is one of the most successful urban legends in the past 20 years. It's so famous, in fact, that it actually has a name. It's called the Kidney Heist Story. Made to Stick, this book that I referred to, lists others. Uh, you may have heard of some of these, the famous Kentucky Fried Rat Story. Uh, one which I bet almost everybody here believes, and that is the, Holly, uh, the uh, Halloween candy scare, where people are putting pins and razor blades and stuff into apples and candy bars, and, and there are a lot more. Now, despite the fact that these stories have been researched and totally disproven, they stick. And the question is, why do they stick? Why are they not only believed, but they are repeated to friends. They are forwarded in Facebook and in email. Well, this book, Made to Stick, identifies uh, six characteristics that contribute to the stickiness of these kind of urban legends. According to the authors, these, this stuff sticks because it's, first of all, simple. It's unexpected. I mean, when I said kidney, you know, ring of, of organ thieves, you know, Simple, unexpected, concrete, credible. I mean, after all, this was a friend of a friend who said it. They are emotional, um, and they involve a story. There's one word that's notably absent in that list, by the way. Let me go through the list again. Simple, unexpected, concrete, as opposed to abstract. You know, credible, emotional, it involves a story. The one word that's notably absent from that list is this. It doesn't say anything about the story being true. People may believe this, but in the case of urban legends, it's not true. No matter how many times it's repeated, no matter who repeats it, no matter how many people believe it. Well, this weekend, I'm really excited. We're starting a new series called 10 Dumb Things Smart People Believe. Um, it's based on a book called 10 Dumb Things Smart Christians Believe, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but I changed the title to 10 Dumb Things Smart People Believe because I think for a number of these spiritual myths and memes that go around, you don't, just, you don't have to be a Christian to believe them. People in our culture, across the culture, uh, believe them. This series is an exploration of just some of the spiritual myths and memes, slogans, legends, and cliches that are promoted as I said, not only in popular Christian culture, but in our culture in, in general. Um, in, in this book that 
we're going to be studying as, uh, as a congregation together, 10 Dumb Things That Smart Christians Believe, Larry Osborne, I think, very helpfully identifies uh, why it is so important to be aware of uh, and why it's important to explore more thoroughly and deeply and why it's really important to explode these spiritual myths and legends. He writes this. He says, spiritual urban legends aren't just harmless misunderstandings. I mean, you can hear the great kidney high story, and, you know, you may not want to travel to Atlantic City, but it probably won't change your life. Spiritual urban legends aren't just harmless misunderstandings, he says. They are spiritually dangerous errors that will eventually bring heartache and disillusionment to all who trust in them. Now, some of you might, might be surprised. That sounds like an, an exaggeration, like an overstatement. I don't think so. Today's topic is a case in point, the myth that faith can fix anything. Osborne begins his book by uh, talking about a, a visit that he and his wife made to some, um, some friends. Um, their names are John and Susan, and Susan uh, had been suffering and struggling and, and trying to fight for the past three years a, a pretty serious um, uh, cancer. Um, for three years, Susan had put up a valiant fight against a disease that was now in its last stages, he writes. Her labored breathing, gaunt figure, deep-set eyes made it painfully obvious that she wouldn't be around much longer. Um, Osborne writes, as we sat by her bed wondering what to say and how to pray, I was stumped. I'm a pastor, and I'm supposed to know what to say in these situations. But before I could say anything profound or even trite, our awkward silence was broken by the entrance of Susan's husband, John, into the room. They exchanged uh, greetings and, and hugs, and then John began to talk, and he talked about the plans he and Susan had for the future, not in a, a kind of regretful reflection of what could have been, but with this powerful conviction of what was yet to be. It was weird. Uh, Susan lay there barely cognizant, struggling for each breath, seemingly hours from death, yet her husband stood inches away talking about future vacations, a kitchen remodel, and their retirement years as if the four of us were hanging out at a backyard barbecue. He wasn't talking about an assurance that she could be healed. He was describing his absolute certainty that she would be healed. He didn't have an ounce of doubt. It was already a done deal. Brimming with confidence, he'd figured he'd arrived at the epitome of faith because he had absolute assurance of what he hoped for and complete certainty of what was yet seen, has not yet been seen. He was, so, he was as giddy as a prospector who just tapped into the mother load. And again, Osborne says, I didn't know what to say. Could it be that God was up to something big? Were we about to witness a miracle? Was John's faith going to pull her back from the jaws of death? I wasn't so sure. He was absolutely certain. That night, she breathed her last breath. John was devastated. For years after Susan's death, he limped along spiritually disillusioned with God, prayer, and the impotence of faith. But his spiritual meltdown had nothing to do with God letting him down. It had nothing to do with the promises of the Bible being hollow it was the predictable result of having placed his trust in the fool's gold of faith's best known and most widely believed spiritual urban legend, the myth that if we have enough faith, we can do or fix anything. Unfortunately, John's concept of faith didn't come from the word of God. It was, um, John was, a victim of a spiritual urban legend. And this is why Osborne writes, spiritual urban legends are not just harmless misunderstanding. They are spiritually dangerous errors that will lead to heartache and disillusionment. You know, one of the things about this series, I just want to give you the heads up, this is going to be a challenging series for us. Uh, we're going to be, uh, think, some of it's going to be very emotional for us. We're going to be thinking maybe more deeply about some things than, than we ever had before. I think some of our assumptions that we already have always made may be challenged a little bit. Where do those assumptions come from? Uh, the Bible, in, in this case, you know, the Bible really does have an incredible amount to, to say about faith, doesn't it? In Matthew 17, 20, 21, for instance, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, it, he was speaking at the Mount of Transfiguration just outside of, uh, of Nazareth, 
You can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You know, when Jesus was talking to those folks, uh, they knew what a mustard seed looked like. Uh, thanks to Pastor Jonathan and a message that he did years ago, this was a little uh, illustration. that If you were here um, the, the week he gave the message, you probably received one of these little packets of, of mustard seeds a, as well. I've got about 50 mustard seeds in this thing. Jesus is saying, if you have faith uh, as small as a, a mustard seed, can anybody see that? I had a hard time, you know, even getting it out, you know, out of my pocket. I, I'm, I'm going to come down here just so, you know, maybe, maybe somebody can. Now, can anybody see that? Oop. <laughs> Does anybody see it now? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a powerful text. If you have faith as small as a mustard just that much faith, if you have faith as small as mustard seed, you can say to this mountain where Jesus was, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be uh, impossible uh, for you. We take a text like that, and we imagine that what Jesus is saying is that if you just believe hard enough, you can have anything. You can do anything. But actually, if you read the verse carefully, it doesn't say anything about believing hard enough, does it? It actually talks about how small your faith can be and, and still uh, have uh, amazing results. It actually says the exact opposite. It's not about how hard we believe or how big our faith is at all. Now, some of you might be going, well, yes, it does. Well, bear with me. The question is this. What is faith? The problem is what... What most people mean when they use the word faith and what the Bible means by faith are really different things. For most people today, faith means believing something is true. Faith is something we have. Faith is something we really believe. It's something we hold to be true. One of the most popular books of the last century was a book written by a guy named Norman Vincent Peale. The book was called The Power of Positive Thinking. Uh, Peel uh, was a pastor, and what he was trying to do, I think, was to take a concept of, of faith and uh, kind of recast it so that people in the modern world could kind of relate to it. And um, it, it launched an, you know, an entire movement, the repercussions of which we are still uh, living with. There were a number of biblical scholars, though, back when this book was first written that took exception with it, and they cleverly critiqued it with a little slogan. Uh, their slogan was this, Paul is appealing. Paul in the Bible, Paul is appealing, but Peel is appalling. And, and why would they say that he's appalling? Because he recast faith in such a way that it, it actually became a false gospel. Um, years later, Robert Schuller, who became a friend of uh, Norman Vincent Peale, uh, rechristened this idea of positive thinking. He called it possibility thinking. And, and other people have also kind of borrowed this same sort of cluster of ideas. Uh, you may have heard people say things like, if you can believe it, you can achieve it. Anybody heard that before? You can believe, uh, you know, name it and claim it. Prosperity gospel, all of this kind of stuff uh, basically goes back to this. Now, while Peel's original intention may have been to make the Bible's concept of faith more accessible and more understandable to modern people, in the end it became, both in practice and in theory, as I said, a false gospel. You can tell that by reading uh, Hebrews 11, which is today's text. The people listed in Hebrews 11 uh, and who are commended for their faith aren't there because they were positive thinkers who visualized victory. They are commended for their faith, which, this is so key, which the Bible understands as trust, as trust. They are commended for their faith, which the Bible understands as trust, and because of their trust in God. That's what Noah and Abraham and Moses and Gideon and David and Samuel have in common. Not that they are possibility thinkers, 
what they have in common. As a matter of fact, a lot of times they don't believe that what God's promising them is going to happen. They actually argue with him and take exception with God, but they trust him anyway. They trust God. They trust God even when they don't understand God. By the way, has anybody here ever not understood God? Yeah, and, and when we do, what do we, you know, we have a choice to make. I don't understand you, but am I going to do what you say anyway, or am I going to say, ah, eh, that's kind of a dumb idea, I'm going to move on. Um, and, and in terms of, of seeing this kind of trust they have, um, think of Noah or think of Abraham. I don't know if you're familiar with Bill Cosby's famous shtick on Noah. It's absolutely hilarious. Uh, uh, basically, God appears to Noah and says, I want you to build an ark. And he doesn't even have any idea what an ark is. By the way, the biblical story is even more remarkable because when God says, I'm going to cause it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights and a great flood will cover the, the earth, that's why the, the ark and all that stuff uh, if you read the biblical narrative starting in Genesis 1, you know, through the story of Noah, one of the things you'll discover is it had never rained before. So it's not that Noah is saying, what's an ark? He's saying, what's rain? It's a remarkable story. Think of, of Abraham. God appears to Abraham and makes this incredible promise. Uh, you and your wife are going to have, um, have children, and because of you, a great nation uh, will, will come into being. You'll have more ancestors than the sands on the shore and the stars in the sky, and through you and your offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. We hear that story and go, wow, that's, you know, talk about awesome faith. Um, we may forget that uh, Abraham and Sarah were in their way senior years, and Sarah was believed um, not to be able to have children. I, they were not possibility thinkers. They weren't, they weren't sitting down and going, I believe that we can have kids, and, you know, even though we're 80, and uh, we can achieve it because I believe it. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7, it's a great verse. And by the way, this verse is actually printed in the bottom of uh, certain cups at In N Out Burger. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, Submit to him. You may have heard it as acknowledge. The, the word actually and the newer translation says submit to him, o obey him, follow him. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. L listen to the first part again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. What God wants is our trust. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. Faith is trust. Faith is trust. And the biblical object of that trust is God. It's absolutely crucial to get this. This is why Jesus says if you have uh, faith as a grain of mustard seed, it's not how big your faith is, it's how big God is. It's about how big God is. You know, you can have an enormous amount of, uh, of faith on really thin ice, and you can say, I believe I could walk across this pond but if the ice is really thin, it doesn't make any difference how big your faith is. What matters is that the ice is melting and it's not going to hold you up. On the other hand, you can have just a little bit of faith in the fact that the ice is really thick because, you know, people have told you this, uh, you know, this ice is really, really thick and you can walk out with them and even though you're a little nervous about it, it will hold you up. You don't need a lot of faith. What you need is thick ice. Faith is trust, and the biblical object of that trust is God. Now, how does that play itself out? You know, when most of us pray, it seems to me uh, we pray prayers of petition. That is, we ask for stuff. We pray for specific outcomes. And the problem is this, that if that specific outcome doesn't come to pass, we assume one of a number of things. We assume maybe that prayer doesn't work. Or we assume that God doesn't care. Or we assume that God can't do stuff. Or we assume that, gee, maybe my faith isn't strong enough. If only I pray harder. If only I'm more sincere. Whatever. What we are, now, the reason I mention that is, is that what we're doing is trusting in a certain outcome 
rather than trusting in God. Does that make sense? We're trusting in some certain outcome rather than trusting in God. We are a lot like the people that one of Job's friends, a guy named Bildad, actually describes in Job chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. We're a lot like this. What they trust in is fragile. What they rely on is a spider's web. They lean on the web, but it gives way. They cling to it, but it doesn't hold. You know, a lot of what we have our faith, you know, put our faith in and our hopes in and our trust in is really fragile. And it's flimsy because it it doesn't come from God. It comes from us. Faith is positive thinking. Faith that trusts in outcomes rather than trusting in God doesn't hold. Faith in God, by the way, faith in God, whether we understand him or not, whether our desired outcome comes to pass or not, has the advantage of being both biblical and being way more robust. That's a lot more robust because it's actually built and based and centered on God. This is the kind of faith that Jesus Uh, teaches. It's the kind of faith that he commends to us in the Lord's Prayer. Help me out with this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, what? Keep going on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, Jesus teaches thy will be done. This is the kind of faith that Jesus himself uh, models um, and shows us in when he prays in Gethsemane. Now, notice, he does share uh, his heart with God. He tells God the Father what outcome he would like to see happen. Let this cup pass from me. God wants to know what we would like because God wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants us to be in relationship with him. Let this cup pass from me. But Jesus then goes on to say, but not my will, but yours be done. You know, it's that kind of faith It's that kind of faith that is commended in today's text in Hebrews 11, where following this glorious passage that describes some of the most amazing victories um, that the great heroes of of faith experience. Let me just repeat them. Um, By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead. This is remarkable stuff, but that's not the whole story. And the passage doesn't end there because if the passage ended there, it would leave us with a a very mistaken notion. It would leave us with um, an urban legend, not with the truth. The truth is after, you know, the author of Hebrews talks about these incredible victories that some people who trusted God experienced, it goes on to talk about other people who, though commended for their faith, though they trusted in God, did not receive what was promised. Did not. You know, that's, that's a re- I know this is a, is, is a hard truth. You read stuff like this, and you go, I, I, I want, you know, I, I want my loved ones to live forever. You know, I, I don't want this relationship to end. I really, uh, really need this job. So I, I get it emotionally and stuff. Why, with all of our heart, we want some. So, so the question is, gosh, if, if faith can't fix everything, why have faith? It's a good question, isn't it? If faith can't fix everything, why have faith? Well, the Bible offers at least three crystal clear and incredibly important answers to that question. The first, I, I think, the most important reason to have faith is because it's what God wants from us. Faith, the Bible says that faith as trust in God pleases God. As a matter of fact, when we don't trust God, it breaks God's heart. Um, 
our daughter is uh, lives in England now, and for the past six weeks, um, she has been home with us, and you know, it's, it really has been a, an awesome visit. It was really hard to drop her off at the flyaway, and, and we're not going to see her again until January. But as I was putting this message together, one of the things that occurred to me uh, as a dad is how devastating it would be to me if my daughter didn't trust me. And some of you, you know, maybe uh, had a parent for whatever reason, because of their brokenness, because of an addiction, because of mental illness, I, you know, I don't know, whatever reason, you couldn't trust your, uh, your parent. And boy, that is tough. To me, it would break my heart if my daughter couldn't trust me, if she thought that I wasn't telling her the truth. And as a result of that, really motivates me to want to live my life in a way so that she knows I'm trustworthy. And I, I think that is, is kind of a, a, a micro uh, illustration of, of what it must be like for God, who wants us to trust him. He created us. He loves us. He sent his son into the world to, to die on a cross for us. He wants us to trust him. And, and yet so often we don't. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You know, it doesn't say anything about uh, without being perfect. You know, if you're not perfect, you're not going to please God. It doesn't say that. It says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And it goes on to say, because anyone who comes to him, and I would say in trust, right, anyone who comes to him in trust must believe that he exists, obviously, and that he rewards, that is, he blesses those who earnestly seek him. You know, when we trust God, blessing comes from that. It may not always be the, the blessing that, that we're looking for at the moment, but if we can trust God, uh, if we can trust God enough that even when some specific outcome doesn't take place that we would really like to see, we still trust God anyway. Th- this is the book of Job. Though he slays me, yet I will trust in him. I'll trust him. You know, this was a mistake that John made with his, his, um, when his wife Susan died. Um, he trusted in the outcome rather than trusting in God. He was devastated by it. The thing is, when someone that we love dies, can we trust God? I think that's the time when you really want to trust God. To trust God... see. The conventional wisdom is this. The conventional wisdom is the way you please God is by trying harder and harder and harder and doing better and better and better. The Bible says the way we please God is by trusting him. Without faith, trust, it's impossible to please God. And and this this is what it's like. To trust God, to trust God is to be able to rest in God's grace confidently, completely. No matter what we're going through, just to rest in God's grace. So the first reason it's a great idea to have faith is because it pleases God. Second reason to live by faith, to trust God completely and confidently, is because faith, while it can't fix everything we would like it to fix, does fix the two biggest problems that we face, and that is the problems of sin and death. Sin and death. Name it and claim it. Believe it and you'll achieve it. Power of positive possibility thinking, visualization techniques, believing harder or trying harder cannot fix the problems of sin and death. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how hard you try. You cannot fix sin and death on your own. But God can. God can, and he has through Jesus Christ, who promised that all who believe in him, trusting him enough to actually follow him and do what he says, will receive forgiveness and eternal life. And the cool thing is, not only does God bless us with, um, with his grace that we receive through faith, that is by trusting him, that overcomes the power of sin and death. God, you know, he forgives us our sin and he gives us the gift of life as we trust him. But also, while faith can't fix everything, there's all kinds of stuff that God does in our lives. He fills our lives with blessing constantly. 
we just take it for granted. It, it, we have issues with God when there's something that we really want and we don't get, and I understand it. Uh, but oftentimes we totally neglect or, or fail to recognize the incredible blessings that God's given us, not only in forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life, but in everything else he grants us. Which leads us to a third biblical benefit and blessing that comes from trusting God. And that's this, the faith gives us a really accurate life map. It gives us an accurate life map that can take us exactly where God wants us to go. Um, the middle chapter of the Bible is Psalm 118. This is just kind of some interesting Bible trivia. That's, that's the middle chapter of the Bible, Psalm 118. The chapter before that, uh, Psalm 117, is the shortest chapter in the Bible. The chapter after that, Psalm 119, is the longest chapter in the Bible. And one of the reasons it's the longest chapter in the Bible is because it is an acrostic poem. It takes every letter of the Hebrew alphabet in alphabetical order and, and devotes eight different verses to each one of these Hebrew letters. And the entire um, content or theme of this powerful acrostic poem is a celebration of God's gift of covenant instruction. That is a, a celebration of, of Scripture, of God's Word. Well, there's a, you know, there are a lot of people in culture today that are extremely dismissive of the Bible, uh, partly because it doesn't promote the, the agenda that they would like to see promoted in, in culture. They view the, the Bible as confusing, as conflicted. Uh, you know, they say stuff like, well, you can, the, you can have the Bible mean anything that you want it to mean. They see it as antiquated and absurd and ridiculous. And you probably know some people that, you know, I, I read a lot of blogs, that, you know, both Christian blogs and blogs, people that are not Christian, and they're just people that bag on the Bible all the time. The psalmist in Psalm 119 says that God's word, rather than being antiquated and ridiculous, actually makes sense of and illuminates life. One of the best verses, one of my favorite verses in Psalm 119 is, uh, I think it was one of, um, uh, um, one of many people's favorite verses. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know that song? Thy word. Um, what that verse is saying is that while God's word might not shed light on absolutely everything immediately for us, at any given moment, God's word tells us ex exactly what we need to see and where we need to go. It's, it's sort of like you're, you know, when you're driving down a, a country road late at night in your car, uh, you turn on the headlights, and you can't see what's going on in the side and, and all this kind of stuff. It doesn't show you everything that's going on. But you know what? You can trust what you do see because it sheds enough light for you to proceed, go, go forward, right? And that's what, the, that's what the psalm is saying. Your word is a light to my path, a lamp uh, to my feet. Uh, Larry Osborne uh, refers to himself as a geographical moron. And some of you um, may be married to people that are geographical morons as well. But I doubt it. Um, but he likens uh, the Bible, and this is kind of, a, kind of a crazy analogy, but I think it works. He likens the Bible to a GPS unit. Um, if you have a GPS unit, by the way, I'm curious, anybody name their GPS unit, the voice in the, the box? Mine's Gloria. Just wanted you, you to know. Um, <laughs> but he's a geographical moron. And, and, and there are times when he's going to, and his wife has convinced him to always pay attention to the GPS and to never doubt it and all this kind of stuff. He, now, he does know that if he's next to the ocean, that, that that's west. But if he's not next to the ocean, he is totally messed up. And so there are a lot of times when he's driving around and he is absolutely convinced that he's going in a certain direction and this patient voice is coming out of the box and going, recalculating, you know. 
at, at the next uh, intersection, please uh, make a U-turn and you know, proceed to da-da-da. Um, and one of the things that Larry has learned is that uh, the voice in the box knows a lot more than he does. Because the voice in the box is the GPS lady's never gotten it wrong. No matter how, how much doubt he's felt, no matter how much resistance, no matter how much he, he feels like saying, I, I don't care what you say, I'm going to go this direction because I think it's better this way. You know, whenever he's done that, it's, he's always been wrong. And God's word is, is like that. I'm told that, uh, that Navy SEALs, when, when they, and other folks in the Navy, when they receive their, their training, one of the things that they do is put them in, in baskets that are shoved underwater at, at really high speed, and they kind of turn them upside down, and there's all this confusion and, and all this sort of thing. And, and they're supposed to figure out how they, you know, get, get out and free themselves and, and get to air. And one of their rules of thumb, it's, it's really a, a simple one, and it works every single time. You want to know where up is? Follow the bubbles. Bubbles always go up. I mean, they might swish around for a while, but ultimately the bubbles go up. God's word's like that. You know, when, when a pilot um, is disoriented, airline pilot, they are trained to trust their instruments. You trust your instrument. Because there are times when... You know, you need an artificial horizon because you can't figure out where the real horizon is. They're trained to trust their instruments, not their feelings. So I'm sorry, I don't care. I love Obi-Wan Kenobi, but I do not care what he says. If Luke Skywalker is piloting an aircraft in which I am a passenger, I do not want him to turn off his instruments and trust the force. By the way, that's an, one of those really dumb things that smart people believe, that your feelings are always trustworthy. Not really. That's, that is not a harmless misunderstanding. It is a spiritual, spiritually dangerous error that leads to heartache and disillusionment. Because here's what your heart will say. Your heart will say, I don't feel like going into work today. I don't want to be married anymore. Dot, dot, dot. You know, and, and by the way, it, it's not just a harmless misunderstanding. It's spiritually dangerous error that can lead to heartache and disillusionment. Just ask anybody, anybody who has ever said, Gosh, it seemed like a really good idea at the time. And you know what? It's usually not a good idea at the time because you're really not following a good idea. What you're following is your feelings and what you would like to be true, not what really is. And this is why Scripture says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. See, faith can't fix everything. It can't. It can't. But faith, when we understand it as trust in God, faith pleases God. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to learn that he really is trustworthy. Faith pleases God. It decisively addresses the problems of sin and death. And those are really the ultimate problems. You know, that's, that's the thing that breaks my heart about this story of John and Susan. Because, yes, Susan died, but John missed the comfort and the benefit and the blessing of knowing that in life and in death we belong to the Lord. And yes, his heart's broken and he's going to grieve and we all are going to grieve. That's a, that's a certainty. But what Scripture says is we don't grieve as other people who have no hope because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And it gives us an accurate life map that takes us exactly where God wants us to go, which is exactly where we need to go because it's in following God that we find blessing. Let's pray together.